Great. Let's get started. Okay, so this is it's gonna be a, this is not the only one of these. Uh, there's okay, where did where did this all come from? We're doing a whole fusion research project, as it's obvious. And then uh, one of the things that came up was looking at different types of well, for one thing, trying to understand how magnetic fusion works, because there's a lot there about the whole electricity, magnetic fields, how do you heat the plasma, they use radio waves to heat the plasma, how do they do that? The other thing is an inertial confinement. The way that the NIF does it is with lasers, but there were also proposals back in the 70s and 80s, which mostly never happened, to use things besides lasers to come in and strike the fusion target, like electrons, or even a xenon nucleus, which is huge. So there are all these different proposals. There's a lot of different ways that we accelerate particles. So if you want to get an electron going to a high speed, or you want to get a xenon nucleus going to a high speed, a xenon ion, you know, how do you get it moving? And then one of the things that came up was, well, what kind of different things can you cause to happen with different accelerated particles? Like you hear about the CERN, you know, the search for the, the Higgs boson, these atom smashers, which have done all sorts of experiments over the years, where they get things going really fast and then run them into other things, what kind of different reactions take place when you've got different energies in those particles? So we haven't really gotten to the particle side of things yet, but on the energy side of things, so what was the difference? You get, uh, NIF uses lasers. A laser is made of light. Light doesn't have any mass. If you have an electron beam, it's made of electrons. They do have mass. You'd say that they're material. They're made of matter. Light is made of photons. It doesn't have a mass. Light doesn't weigh anything. It doesn't, uh, yeah, anyway. The light, light's, light's not matter. Different kinds of things. So we're going to look mostly at today here is that, uh, is look at what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. Is that, people heard that term before, electromagnetic spectrum? If you look at your wonderful chart, uh, you can see it goes from radio, it's labeled from radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma ray. And you've probably heard of all those things. You may or may not have known that they're all basically the same, in some way they're all the same process. The light we're seeing is the same kind of process as the radio waves that go to our car or our phones the same as the x-rays at the dentist's office, the gamma rays that are hitting the planet from outer space or from nuclear decay and other things. It's all in a certain way the same thing. It's all made out of photons. So photon, what does the word sound like? Um, Photo, yeah. photograph, pho uh, anyway, light, you know, vision. So you don't usually think of, you, might, you can think of x-rays you know, X-rays come in individual chunks. They're, you can call them photons. Gamma rays, sometimes you even hear people say gamma particles or gammas. You can call those photons if you want. And although it's really weird to think about it this way and not really applicable to the way they're used, you could even say that radio waves come in photons. So when you're listening to WTOP, their antenna is transmitting photons in all directions that happen to go through almost everything unlike light, which doesn't go through a building to reach your, you know, the radio you have at home or something like that. But radio waves are, in a certain way, they're photons that are going right through the wall into your home. But it's not really helpful to think about them that way. Okay, so why is it called electromagnetic spectrum? Um, let's just start with the long end. I was going to give a quick overview of some of these things, and I think it would actually be best to read through this together, because that's, we did the base one a couple times. Apologies to those in the basin are here, but there's new things, okay? <laughs> so, um, start with the longest waves, radio waves. As it says here, you can see how radio waves are, you know, they can be a kilometer long in their wavelength. So let's, let's just write a couple of these terms up here. So here we got a wave, which you could make with, you know, you got like a rope and you're swinging it up and down, or if you look at a string, and you plug a string on a cello or something, it's vibrating. It's moving like this, uh, you know, you can't really see it so well. Usually on a, on a musical instrument, it might look more just like this. It's just going up and down and up and down. The whole string is just going up and down and up and down. The overtones, though, that the string is making is when it's also going like this. 
that wave's also in it. One where it's got a spot right in the middle, making the octave. Mm. So when you've got a, basically any string, so if you've got a, um, it's like on a piano, if you push down a key gently so it doesn't, the hammer doesn't actually hit the string, and you play the same note an octave up, it'll end up resonating in that lower string. Because that's, the string can vibrate with the full length of the string, or with half of it, or with a third of it. So this thing will just be wobbling up and down. These are, th those are different kinds of waves. Light waves are pretty similar. Uh, it's something that seems, to, you know, it acts like it's going up and down. It's got a couple of, some aspects to it. It's got what's called a wavelength. And the Greek letter lambda gets used for that. So the wavelengths, wavelengths really vary. Um, you know, the wave, wavelength of, uh, of an FM radio station is about 10 feet. The wavelength of a, you know, of a dental or a doctor's x-ray is, uh, forgetting I know exactly, a doctor's x-ray would be like a billionth, a, thou a millionth of a millimeter. That's how small the wavelengths are in the dental x-ray. The radio, you know, FM radio waves 10 feet long. So there, there's a huge range in these things. So you got the wavelength, and you've also got, as the light's moving, you can almost think of like the light as being like a jiggling string, there's how many times does the wave happen in a second. Mm -hmm. So if we counted them up in one second, like, you know, you, 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 it would just be a count. How many times per second? So that gets, called, that's the Greek letter, it looks just like a V in that printout, but it's a new, and that's the frequency. And that's in cycles per second, which has the name Hertz. Hmm. So if something's 256 cycles per second, 256 Hertz per middle C, that's, that's what it is. The string's vibrating 256 times a second to make that sound. There's a connection between these two for light. Um, let's say we, we've got how far light moves. Does anybody know how far light moves in a second? You don't you have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> you can go around like the Earth like seven plus times or whatever. Several times, yeah. The light moves at a, it goes three hundred thousand kilometers in a second, which is pretty far. So every in one second, light goes three hundred thousand kilometers. So the relationship between the wavelength and the frequency. Over 300,000 kilometers, let's take one second of that path of light that's doing this thing. We can count up how many, how many cycles were there, what the frequency was, and how long the wavelength is. Well, the wavelength times the number of those waves is the total distance that the light traveled in that second. So the speed of light is, this, is, uh, is the wavelength times the number of those waves, which you say C, which is light. And these formulas are all in the, they're in the printout, but that's why that's why that one's true. Um, so for any kind of, oh, and there's one more thing, too. Planck had shown how, for given oscillations, not quite like piano strings, but that, let's jump ahead. Light is quantized, and that was found Einstein really did a lot of work on the photoelectric effect, how shining light on metals would sometimes cause electricity to come out of it. But that the way it happened made it really clear that the light was coming in in individual pieces. That light came in, in, in particles, that it was quantized. Mm -hmm. And Planck had given for, a, for one photon that the energy of that one photon is equal to some constant times the, the frequency of the light. So the higher the frequency, the more it's jiggling up and down, the more energy each little bit of that light has. I'm going through all that to say that for any kind of infra uh, electromagnetic radiation, it's got a wavelength, it's got a frequency, and each photon, each particle of it, each photon has an energy. So for any kind of any kind of electromagnetic radiation, you could say it's got a wavelength of such and such, it's got a frequency of so many hertz, and it's got an energy of so many electron volts is the usual unit. We'll get what an electron volt is.
Okay. So that, that, but that, that, that's some of the basic terminology here. Frequency, wavelength, energy, any kind of radiation, any kind of photon has all three. And they're not independent. They're all, they're all tied together. Did the idea that they were photons come from Einstein? Or did people think that light was discrete? It, well, no, I mean, it, it, it's a really old thing, like the, between you know, Huygens and Newton. and I mean, the debate about whether light was came in, in little particles or as a wave is a very old one. But before Planck, it had been definitively decided that light was a wave. And there was, there was, there was no reason to ever think it was a particle. Mm -hmm. There were things where it was impossible to be a particle, like diffraction. I mean, you help use a laser pointer and you put the tip of a pin in the path, and then you know you look at the shadow on the wall and you can see the ripples in it, the ridges. Yeah. That works if it's waves. It doesn't make any sense if it's particles. Mm -hmm. So experiments like that led basically everybody to say, forget the particle view, Newton was wrong, light's a wave. Mm -hmm. So the photoelectric, uh, so when Planck, this is why it was kind of a huge deal when Planck said that this kind of radiation was actually quantized, yeah. because that had been, you know, thrown out for, you know, since, you know, a long time. So. Yeah. But then Planck didn't necessarily think that all light was quantized. He did not want to think that. He wasn't trying to prove that. Mm -hmm. That's what Einstein, but that it's, that's what Einstein really showed. Mm. So, you know, by 19, I mean, but by that time, it was like, okay, all light, all electromagnetic radiation, all light comes from quantum. Mm -hmm. So it's very recent. It's only 100 years old, that concept. Or that concept, you know, in a way that was right, not the. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyways, that's why you get the problem that it seems to do both in the whole wave particle problem. How do you explain diffraction without the particles? How do you explain the photoelectric effect? You can't with waves. So, right. you know, what are you going to do? So that's the general stuff about naming them and everything. That's sort of after the fact. This is like from today. But now if we go back and, and look at how the things got uh, used, obviously light was the first one. So light was first measured. Nobody was measuring the cycles per second of light, right? I mean, you're not going to forget it. No one's measuring the energy per photon of light because that concept didn't exist. It was the wavelength of light. So different colors of light coming through a prism would make different diffraction patterns. Those ripples the, where the shadow's not sharp, but it's got the bands of light along the side of it, those, their size would change depending on the color of light from the prism that you used. Mm -hmm. And so with some very clever work on interference, people were measuring in the 1800s the, the, the wavelength of light. So people had an idea that you know the visible range is about 400 to 900 nanometers, which is a billionth of a meter. So that was, you know, that, that's, that's like 150 years. It might, these dates are all really kind of guesses. Or they're rough. 200, 150 years old, somewhere in there. Okay, but let's, 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 let's start from the long ones. Uh, radio waves. Radio waves, they're definitely electromagnetic. They really seem nothing like light. They don't seem like they're made out of pieces. Every way that we use radio waves has nothing to do with photons. It's all about the fact that it's electromagnetic. So the antenna on your car is of a certain size. Remember how I was saying that FM radio waves are 10 feet long? Mm -hmm. Well, FM radio waves are about 10 feet long. You don't have a 10-foot antenna on your car. You don't have a 5-foot antenna on your car. But if you measure the antenna, you'll find it's about 2 and a half feet. It's a fourth of the length of the waves it's supposed to pick up. And it's designed that way on purpose. So the, what the radio waves are doing is that, I mean, you're in your car, you don't change the length of your antenna to like, tune your radio exactly. It's not that precise. That's what your, ra your radio takes care of that. But the, the waves from the radio station are actually making electricity move in your antenna. Hmm. How, do, how does the radio station transmit? They got a big antenna, and they, just, they make electricity go back and forth and back and forth in it. Hmm. And then the fact that it's wobbling around like that makes a wobbling magnetic and electric field that travels through space reaches your car antenna and it makes electricity wobble in your car antenna. So the way you use it is with an electric circuit. Just like you know the electronics in here or whatever. It's, it, it really is electro, it's very much electromagnetic radio waves are. When you get to light it gets a little bit, uh, it starts to get different. You got 
Radio waves, microwaves, they act a certain way. They're basically very much electromagnetic. Light seems to have a different character to it. For one thing, we can see it. Light's powerful enough to cause chemical changes, which a radio doesn't. You know, that's why you're never going to find some animal that can see radio waves, at least not the way that we can see light. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be that they actually see what, you know, what direction the radio wave came into some eye that they had. In what way does light make chemical changes? There's a, there's a chemical in the eye um, that, uh, in, the, in, the, in the retina, and the, some of these compounds they have like a, see I don't really know how much all this stuff's exactly true, but you know, they'll draw it like here's this you know, chemical structure and it's got oxygen over here and sulfur over here or something. What happens is when light hits the back of your eye, it makes one of these bonds basically sort of flip 180 degrees. And then, I don't know with the whole train of events how that ends up making an electrical thing that gets to your brain, but it, it actually is powerful enough to change chemical bonds. That the energy of chemical, it's like radio waves, they, only, they act on big things. They move electricity back and forth. Microwaves, this is, a, this is a magnetron. This is what makes your, this is how you heat your food in your microwave. There is an electron gun back here that shoots out electrons. They go through a magnetic field and then they, they get spun. Um, basically, they're made to oscillate at the right frequency to make microwaves. So it's, instead of a whole circuit where electricity is going back and forth, now on the scale of just individual electrons, you're making them wiggle around and that makes the microwaves. So it's still, you know, electrons moving, electromagnetic. Um, then you get to light, which is more powerful. A microwave doesn't really cause chemical changes. What it does is that it's still, the, it, it's, it's the magnetic aspect of it that warms your food. The, it, it's tuned just right so that it's as though someone's wiggling a magnet next to your food, and the magnet's moving at just the right speed that water molecules vibrate. Just like the, if you have the right, just like when you held that lower key on the piano and you hit the, the note one octave up and it resonates, water resonates because of the size of the molecule with the right wavelength of a change in, in an electromagnetic field. Mm -hmm. So the water molecule itself gets pulled back and forth. It's, you're not, it's not jiggling with the bonds in the mo water molecule, it's just that the oxygen side's more negative, and the wait, right? Uh, yes, and the hydrogen, the well, hydrogen's more positive, so it's like a little charged thing, so it gets pulled back and forth by the microwaves. When you get to light, now you're starting to get chemical changes. So the light that we see that causes chemical changes in our eyes. Animals that see infrared, they really don't see it the way our eyes work at all. They see it by something getting warmer, mm. and they, they notice a difference in the warmth. Um, you know, like our night vision goggles are fantastic. I mean, there's no, no there, there aren't animals that can see as well as that. <laughs> ultraviolet gets get more powerful. Um, you can start with visible light and ultraviolet. You can start breaking electrons out of atoms, um, which is how solar panels work. Photoelectricity, and then when you start getting more and more powerful into the X-rays and the gamma rays. And now it starts becoming more clear that they come as individual particles. When they were first being studied, it was, it wasn't just a stream of, uh, it wasn't just like light where it's just sort of this stream of stuff coming out. It was becoming, and these things were being, the x-rays and electrons both were being discovered right around the turn, you know, right around 1900, um, using tubes very much like this. This is a, this is a tiny little TV set. So it's it's empty inside. It's a, there's a vacuum inside it, which is why if you if you break a TV, it implodes. And then the back of this thing, there's a little electrode electron gun, which spits out electrons. So the same instrument, this vacuum thing with electrons coming out. Also, when they hit the right kind of metal, they'll make X-rays. So electrons and X-rays are sort of discovered mm -hmm. together because the same piece of apparatus. It was made possible. All this was possible by somebody developing a better kind of vacuum pump. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the one that didn't leak. Instead of because uh, you know you get the, the the piston in the cylinder and there's always a little bit of leak around mm -hmm. the edges. It used columns of mercury to do the pumping, so there's oh. no there's no way to leak. And finally, with that, I forget the guy's name. I think Geisler or 
they was they finally had really good vacuums, mm. and then you could get the anyway. Back to that. Um, I, okay, well, you know, electron. We're, we're not talking about electrons. We're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. So, come back to that. Um, okay, there's a lot of details that I've got, but I think the best way to do that really is just to read this together and talk about it instead of. I'm basically just going to be reading it otherwise, which I could do, but that seems kind of. Oh, I could read it. <laughs> I'll just read it. I'm here anyway. Okay. So, uh, interrupt any time. Um, okay, we got this terminology. We got that frequency wavelength energy. We got that. Well, here's some example wavelengths. Oh yeah, think about how many different kinds of radios are in your phone. Have you ever seen how it'll say like set like radio? You see the term used on a radio on a, a cell phone or a computer? It talks about your radio being on or off. Well, if you, like, you turn your Wi-Fi or your Bluetooth, sometimes it says radio on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're not listening to a radio station, but it's the exact same kind of thing. So if you think uh, like a phone is going to have, um, don't quote me on this exactly, but it's, you know, it's got, there's one frequency for calls. Um, if you're using 4G, it's a different frequency. If you're on Wi-Fi, it's a different frequency. If you're using Bluetooth, it's a different frequency. Frequencies, NFC, near field communication. Have you seen the ads where people are touching the phones to each mm -hmm. other and everybody's watching this thing and it's mesmerizing? That uses a different frequency. So there's like six different radio transmitters and receivers in your phone. Mm -hmm. All these different wavelengths. And some pretty amazing. They put them all in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that they don't interfere with each other. They don't interfere. It all works. They've got a. You know, they're much. These are much shorter wavelengths than. Um, like a uh, 4G is the wavelength is about 50. Uh, uh, well, I give the wavelength, yeah. I mean the frequency. The, the way. Um. You know, they're they're pretty short. They're not 10 feet long, like um, like radio waves are. The uh, the near field communication wavelength is 60 feet, which is pretty long. Let me just give that thing. Right. There's one more. Should I make any more than that? No, it's not one. Okay. All right, for a particular type of electromagnetic radiation, we can speak of its frequency, its wavelength, and the energy of its constituent photons. In usual speech, radio waves and microwaves are discussed in terms of frequency, like the FM station at 90.1 megahertz, a microwave oven, 2.45 gigahertz, which is like almost exactly Bluetooth, uh, our 4G service at 700 megahertz, Bluetooth, 2.4 gigahertz, Frequencies. Lights discussed in terms of wavelength, which we got from those interference patterns I was talking about, like saying, okay, this light has got a wavelength of 470 nanometers. Uh, and then the, the energetic ones are given in terms of their energies, like the gamma rays that each have 511 kilo electron volts that are happening when an electron and a positron touch each other and both disappear and turn to energy. So for all the things here, I'm going to give all three values, frequency, wavelength, energy. The relations given by this formula is I just went through. Long wavelengths have lower frequencies, less energy. Short wavelengths have high frequencies, more energy. Less energetic radiation acts on larger processes. More energetic radiation goes into the small. As we get smaller, we get more powerful see when we go from, you know, using the power of, of falling, you know, rock or water versus burning something where we're now using not just the mass but the chemical bonds to mm -hmm. nuclear. Now we're getting even smaller inside the atom. Isn't uh, So there's three main categories, radio and microwaves, light, three kinds of light, infrared, uh, which would be like your own. Oh, visible and ultraviolet. It's like, you know, remote controls for TVs. If you can't see them, it's, I forget, I think it's ultraviolet light. If it's not, it's infrared, I forget which way. Probably ultraviolet. And then you get x-rays and gamma rays. Okay, so let's start with radio waves. 
radio waves that get a frequency up to one gigahertz. So let me just write the letters up. Uh, so kilo or kilo is a thousand mega giga tera. I mean, these, they get kind of useless at that point, eta and peta. Wait, did I get those backwards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, PETA comes after Terra, doesn't it? Oh, okay. All right, PETA and then EXA. So radio waves are up to gigahertz. Radio waves are at least 30 centimeters long, and their energies are below four microelectron volts, which will mean something a little bit later. They're so long and so non-energetic that they don't really make anything happen on a small scale. They correspond to moving charges in large structures, like the car antenna, and they're used to communicate by inducing similar moving charges in other antennas. A typical antenna is one-fourth the wavelength. So for an FM station with a wavelength of two, 10 feet, a two-and-a-half-foot antenna is ideal. Now you know why a car antenna has the length it does. To tune into a specific station, the radio receiver creates a circuit that resonates at that specific frequency. So it's sort of as though you're inside the radio, like you're moving your finger up the neck of a violin, and then the sound around it will eventually cause the string to resonate. Mm. So that's, sort of, that's what tuning your radio does. It changes the circuit inside so that that exact kind of transmission will resonate with the circuit. And that's how you hear one station instead of hearing everything all at once, because mm -hmm. everything's going to your antenna, but you yeah. only hear the one thing you're trying to tune into, wow. or the one call that you're on. Some of these wavelengths are huge. Despite their long length, Schumann resonance waves, which are only 3 to 60 hertz. So their wavelengths are 5,000 to 100,000 kilometers, larger than the Earth, yet they've still got some impact on us. Even though our brains aren't antennas that are you know, 10 times the size of the Earth or anything. But if we have some circuits or something in our brain, if we're somehow resonating with these things, that explains it, even though they're that huge. They're able to heat plasma. So you'll see radio frequency, or RF, heating, described as among the ways of heating up uh, plasma in a tokamak. This is for magnetic confinement. So it occur, that happens when dielectric materials with some polarity, meaning that they've got, they're more charged on one side. They're like little charged things, is what dielectric means there. You make them shift their orientation and move around. It makes them jostle and heat up. And uh, they're moved for the same reason. It, it moves things just the same way as in an antenna. So one question is, why does plasma resonate with such low frequencies? Mm. You know, it's like a microwave. You know, you, you know, a microwave will heat your hamburger or whatever. But I think the radio frequencies for plasma are could be. I have to find out what those wavelengths are. What it might mean is that there's actually like structures forming in the plasma that are resonating with mm. those wavelengths as opposed to per ion or something, per atom in the plasma. So that's something to find out more about. So then we get microwaves. Uh, microwaves, they're also used for communication. I should have put a picture. Have you, ever, you know you see on the cell phone towers or transmission towers, you see the antennas up at the top, and then it's you know, lower on or midway up, you'll see these round drums. Look like they're about this big in diameter. Yep. You know? If you, uh, I don't project, if you use a Google image uh, cell phone, like in, transmission antenna or something, you, if you look up microwave antenna or microwave, anyway, those are microwave, those are transmitting mm -hmm. microwaves. So that'll be, you know, the cell phone, the, the other smaller antennas are going to your phone, the big microwave things will go from one tower to another. They, they, they can have a lot more what in their signal. What do we use microwaves to transmit? What do we use them to transmit? Yeah. Data. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Oh, because you said that the Bluetooth wavelength is similar to a microwave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're because they're really high. Because the higher the frequency, the higher the, the data rate you can get. Yeah. Which is also it's not the only reason that FM stations sound so much better than AM, but it's one of them. Like take an AM station. Like what's what's an AM station? No, WTOP. What's what's their one three point five. Oh, what, that's well, an FM. That's like an AM. FM. Oh. They do have an AM 1200. station. 1,200. 1,200 watts. 
So 100 kilohertz, mm -hmm. which is the same as 1.2 megahertz. So the AM is on 1.2 megahertz. Oh. WTOP is at 103.5 megahertz. So that WTOP is at 100 times the frequency of the AM station. So because you got it's you know you got it's changing a hundred times as rapidly, you can get more information in that signal. That's that's not the only the FM also works in a different way than AM, but that's part of why you get a higher rate or why they try to use high frequency is for Wi-Fi, for example. You know, the octets fast for Wi-Fi is you know, two point four gigahertz. You try to use mm. high frequencies, you can get more more data put through on it. They're also used for heating and radar. So microwaves, they're one to 100 gigahertz, which is three millimeters to 30 meters. That's their range. Um, electron volt numbers don't mean anything. We use them for communications and heating. Um, they were first used for radar, and it was sort of discovered by accident. The story is that some guy had a chocolate bar, and he was working on the radar dish, and it melted his chocolate no. bar. <laughs> no. Although somebody pointed out, and, you know, I think anybody with a chocolate bar in their pocket is probably going to start melting, <laughs> presuming that he wasn't, you know, a snowman. Um, so our microwave ovens, 2.45 gigahertz, right next to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth frequencies. Uh, and so that's, these corresponds to moving microwaves around. They can't ionize. So ionize would mean to make, when something's, if you have an atom, when it's an ion, ion means it's charged. Mm -hmm. How do you make an ion char an atom charged? Not right. Take away an electron or add another one to it. But the reason why blue Bluetooth doesn't like cook your brain is because your water molecules are a very specific measurement and they don't resonate, even though it might be very, very close in wavelength, it will only resonate with one and it doesn't resonate with the other. I think so. Or it might just be it's so weak that it doesn't eat your brain. I don't know. Uh, I really don't know that. Well, if it's so close to a microwave, it's, pretty close. it's hard to say that it's so weak. But like being no, but I mean like the microwave oven uses a lot of. I mean the amount of energy that your 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 Bluetooth headset. It's not like you plug it into a wall and it's like makes your lights dim and you get a phone call or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's what I meant. But I'm also saying call like call being energy. close, yeah, well, like the the analogy you're using with. A piano string. Mm -hmm. If you're out of tune, it's not going to make right. it vibrate, exactly. even if it's really close. Right. Like even if like oh, it's so close, it's a half step off, but it's not going to make it vibrate at all. Right. Mm -hmm. It's only until it's in tune right. that it's going to make it sympathetically vibrate. And that's very important with spectroscopy like when we use light to study the bonds and you know the, the um. Like when you, you burn various substances and you look at the light and you put it through a spectrum, uh, a prism, you get very specific bands of light that it makes. Like yeah. sodium lights that the, um, I don't want to seem around town too much, but uh, the old Rite when it closed down before it turned into an auto zone, at night the light in there was really orange, the security lights they had on there, those are sodium lights. Mm -hmm. They make basically just one kind of orange. And that's mm -hmm. really the only kind of light that comes out of an excited sodium atom. Mm -hmm. um, Different things make different kinds of light. Also, different kinds of chemical bonds. If the right, you send the right kind of light, the energy in that light is sympathetic with that bond, and then the substance would absorb that kind of light. So there's kinds of infrared spectroscopy that let you know not just what elements are there, which you get by burning things, but also you see that there's carbon and oxygen. Is it carbon dioxide? Is mm -hmm. it carbon monoxide? You see carbon and hydrogen. Is it methane? Is it Potato starch, you know, you, you, hmm. so you get to, you're right, so yeah, very small differences can be very, very important. It's just, if it's not in tune, it's not in tune. Right. Right, hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so that's all I had about microwaves, because, you know, they cook things. Anyways, so this is uh, this is the thing that makes your food. This this thing shoots out the microwaves, and there's something, I think it's generally at the top of the, you can, they can also get bounced around, they reflect. So. Hmm. You know, if you look at a microwave, it's not usually like there's something this tall above the top of where your food is. It'll be on the side behind the numbers, mm -hmm. I think, and then it goes boom, boom, boom. And yeah. then there's a scatterer thing to make it get uh, on your food. How do you make a microwave? You, uh, so in here, it's, um, so in terms of setting up those, like moving the finger along the neck of the violin and changing the kinds of frequencies that the string could resonate with, mm -hmm. 
when you're getting wavelengths as short as a microwave, I mean, these wavelengths are what, three millimeters up to 30 meters. They're getting, they're getting shorter. Yeah. So they're getting so small and so fast that it's harder to make something jiggle that quickly mm -hmm. with a whole circuit. So what they do is the electron gun in the back makes them shoots out electrons. When electrons go through a magnetic field, they spiral. And then there's little cavities in here. I don't really know exactly, but basically they get tricked into, they get co urged into vibrating at just the right, in mm -hmm. just the right radius or whatever, mm -hmm. so that they start singing the right kind of sound, so to speak. Really? Yeah. Hmm. yeah something like that. And it's, uh, more about the wonder of microwaves, we can find out more details, but it's something like that. Where instead of the whole electric, electric circuit going back and forth at the right frequency to make the radio antenna do its thing, the individual electrons now are being made to go back and forth. It's so one at a time, sort of in an empty thing. Mm. So you, you do the same thing in the CRT by changing an electric for a magnetic field. You know, you make the, the uh, beam go back and forth at a specific frequency. Yeah, and it depends on the frequency at which you're changing, whether you're using an electric or magnetic field. Yeah. So. Yeah, here it's much, here we're, they're, we're getting them to spiral in a, in a stronger magnetic, hence the name magnetron. Right. <laughs> right. With this guy, well, we'll get into, we'll talk about him at the end. <laughs> and we'll get to x-rays. Because that thing could make x-rays if it's not used. It has a warning here. Careful, this might make x-rays if misused. Because <laughs> it could. <laughs> This is, I mean, basically, this is not that much, it's not really different in form than the thing that, you know, sits next to your head and makes x-rays at the dentist's office or mm -hmm. the doctor's office. Okay, but next there's this weird frequency range called terahertz or submillimeter, which is, as you might guess, shorter than a millimeter. So 300 gigahertz to 3 terahertz, 100 micrometers to 1 millimeter, 1 millielectron volt to 10 millielectron volts. So this is sort of where we're definitely getting a shift from radio waves into light. And this region, it's really hard to make radiation in this range. Electric circuits that you would use to resonate to make a radio wave, they just can't, they can't go quick enough. The frequency is too high, not going to work. You can't use things that make light, or infrared light, to make wavelengths this low. Not entirely, it just, it just, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, it involves really difficult ways of making it. Anyway, um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's part of a shift. There aren't really hard shifts between radio, microwave, light. I mean, visible light, obviously, there's a hard shift. If you can't see it, then it's not visible. But other than that, it's sort of the boundaries are kind of blurred. And so this is sort of a definite blurring region here. Um, we're making big breakthroughs in making them. Uh, but only it's actually only been in the past few years, like five, six years, they were able to make these without superconductors and like strong magnetic fields. And now there's nothing you're going to be able to carry around and make this kind of frequency. A microwave oven's not that hard to make. A cell phone, you, know, you carry it around. You know, this is some, you know, you need these big machines to make these kinds of radiation. Um, it also, it, uh, water absorbs it, so it's, it doesn't really have much of a distance that it can go through the atmosphere. Um, you could use it for short distance communication, like really fast Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. It's also used by, I think, Raytheon for their skin burning machine, the active denial system for crowd control. It's this thing you put out and it mm -hmm. emits this kind of radiation and it just makes your skin burn. It's like a microwave, mm -hmm. kind of, but it's a different frequency. And anyway, that's one of the applications of it. <laughs> Good thing it's hard to make. Jeez. Yeah, that is kind of nice. Except isn't for it? what is this? Scotch tape thing? Oh, scotch tape. Well, rubbing things together makes all sorts of kinds of light. And, like, I think that's part of the, uh, the thing about uh, the lifesavers. Wintergreen oh. lifesavers. Wintergreen lifesavers. Well, if you crunch them in a dark room, people yes. see the sparks true. in your mouth. You can also make, it's sort of the same thing that makes it like when you rub, like, rabbit fur or a balloon on a sweater and get, you get the static electricity. It does, it'll transfer electrical charges, but it also will make these kinds of radiations. So if you get the right things rubbing together, you can make x-rays or this, or <laughs> apparently scotch tape makes this. Uh, mm. uh, not a lot of it, you know, 
I don't think Raytheon's machine has huge spools of scotch tape that get unpeeled when the enemy is trying to raid the, you know, bunker or something. <laughs> so, uh, I just told you to demonstrate how weak they are. In 2010, Jefferson Lab, right here in Virginia, created the strongest coherent terahertz radiation, 20 watts. Which is like a very dim light bulb. So, it obviously, it's kind of tough to make this stuff. Anyway, just a list of things that can make it. Synchrotron radiation, we're going to come back to that. Synchrotron radiation can make anything. It's, it's a way it really can make any kind of light, any kind of electromagnetic radiation. So, all right, so let's get into, so now we're getting into light kinds of things. Uh, so infrared, heat. Uh, night vision cameras, use infrared as do heat lamps that keep your french fries warm. And you know, if you have infrared cameras, you can see things at night, but it also gives you a sense of how hot things are. Mm. Like you see people's faces, you know, your eyes, are, you know, like your face is really, your eyes are really warm. You know, your fingers might be cold, but you know, your body keeps itself warm in the important places. Um, so like sunlight, here, yeah, here's an example of it. Sunlight, the light that hits us, 527 watts of it are infrared. 445 are visible, and 32 are ultraviolet, and they give you a sunburn. Uh, so, black body radiation. Kind of, it's sort of a mystery. This is the thing that, that Planck had developed the theory for. This is what the people had, uh, what's the guy's name? I forgot the formula for it before Planck. That never, when things get hotter, they, basically anything that's not absolutely zero emits some energy. It gets energy from the environment and re-emits it. You know, if, if the, the heat from a lamp, for example, landed on a chair, and the chair never radiated ener any energy out, yeah, the chair would start getting hotter and melt or something, right? That doesn't happen. The chair lets off the light that it gets. It lets off the energy that comes into it. So there's a, a curve based on the temperature of a body that tells you how much mm -hmm. light of what wavelength is going to come out of it. Depending on what it's made out of? Depending on its temperature only. Depending on what it's made out of will determine which bands of light get made, but the relative strengths of the different wavelengths, that's really only its heat. Hmm. Which, is, kind of, which is an astonishing thing already. Um, there's a chart of it moving in the um, militation dissertation video. You can see how the, the shape of the oh, spectrum yeah. changes. So at first, it's, it's all in the infrared. So everything around us right now, it's emitting light that we can't see. It's infrared light. That's why you turn all the lights off, and infrared camera, we'll see everything in the room. Because mm -hmm. everything's emitting heat. Everything's emitting, yeah, right. And then as things get hotter, they start inching their way up into red. And then more orange, yellow, gets to looking white eventually. Mm. If it got incredibly hot, like plasma or something, it would look blue. Mm. Maybe lightning does, it's a little blue. Mm -hmm. I mean, there might be other reasons why lightning looks bluish, but anyway, so they're all emitting this. So infrared, you know, everything is emitting this infrared light, and if it gets hot enough to start glowing, it'll let off other kinds of light that our eyes can actually see. Um, according to Callahan, insects, it, and turn, how, how, do, how do things see infrared? Insects don't really see infrared by, um, you know, the way our eye works. This guy Callahan, the bug man, well, I don't know how to describe him. Anyway, he says that, the, uh, that their little antennas really are antennas, and they actually resonate like little ra radio receivers, which is pretty amazing considering how short these wavelengths are. Um, but they're really tiny little antennas on there, the little bristles on them. So that's how he thinks they see infrared. Snakes that see infrared, they do it by heating. They got little sacks of water that get heated. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, by sacks of water, I mean cells. They have water. <laughs> I mean, they do it by something getting hot. Yeah. It's not the chemical change that happens in the the, uh, the opsin, whatever it's called in our eye. Okay. It's a different kind of eye. Um, night vision goggles work in the near infrared, you know, pretty close to visible. Fiber optics uses infrared light because it. I mean, glass looks pretty clear, but it really isn't totally clear. And if you're going to get like miles of fiber optics, you want to find the kind of light that glass is most clear too. 
And that kind of infrared, I guess, is just perfect. The glass barely absorbs any of it. So that's how they, because they had to pick what, what kind of light goes through infrared. I mean, through a fiber optics. You know? right. So, okay, so infrared spectroscopy is incredible. This, this is where the thing about the resonating with the, not the object, not, now we're not going to resonate with like the whole antenna, we're not going to resonate with a circuit made up of wires that has like an actual size in the macro world. We're not going to res, you know, we're now we're resonating with bonds between atoms. So infrared, I don't totally understand this, but infrared spectroscopy lets you look at the kinds of molecules that exist because the bond between say a sulfur and an oxygen there's a certain amount of energy in that bond. And some of the infrared light that you come in, that you send to it, it's just at the right frequency, will get absorbed by that bond and then make it wiggle more. I don't really know what it does differently when it absorbs it, but I guess it gets a little excited or something. Mm. And then not as much will come through. Mm. So you send a bunch of infrared through, most of it goes through, but some of, some little bands of it get absorbed. And that'll tell you, ah, I know. Right, I know that the sulfur in this mystery thing is combined with oxygen. Mm. So that's how, that's the way they can say it, what, what some stellar dust somewhere is. Right. You know, you can get an idea of the elements from, well, we're going to get to that kind of spectroscopy, but the chemical bond, the infrared, would let you know about the kinds of bonds in the kinds of molecules that are formed. So, so we have infrared telescopes mm -hmm. that are looking in time. Mm -hmm. Amazing, hmm? Um, okay, more to say about the vision goggles. Okay. Visual. Well, this is the light we can see. This definitely has a definite boundary. Although, if you do not have a lens on your eye, you can see ultraviolet light. Our vision receptors in the back of our eye, they will respond to ultraviolet, you know, to near ultraviolet. But the, your, the lens in your eye would, would absorb it so it would never get back there. Hmm. It's a birth defect, but people that without a lens can actually see the white lens. Just as an interesting thing there. <clears throat> so this kind of energy, it could come from thermal radiation emission, flat body radiation. It could come from electrons changing their levels. More about that. Or from chemical bonds that change, like in a firefly, when it makes light or in our eyes when it absorbs light. So, what else is there to say about it? Um, oh yeah, these lights. So how does a fluorescent light work? <laughs> yeah. So the kind of light you're seeing is, is actually coming from the, the, the paint on the inside of the light. If, if these lights weren't coated, it, the very little light would come out. And basically, it's ultraviolet light. Like these would be light for the tanning salon or something if they did well sort of except glass absorbs the ultraviolet basically there's some gas in there poisonous mercury gas which is going to kill us all when they break open um, <laughs> and it forms that's a plasma in there so there's a current that's traveling through all this ionized mercury and mostly mercury it's basically like a neon sign mm -hmm. where it's red or whatever color they are this it's a color that's you can't see it's ultraviolet and then they paint the inside with phosphors that uh that fluoresce. Mm. This is a fluorescent, why they're fluorescent lights. Fluorescence means when one kind of light gets absorbed and then re emits as a different kind. Like a fluorescent marker, a highlighter, mm -hmm. the reason they look so really bright is because they're taking the light that we can't see and re emitting it as like that yellow color. Mm -hmm. So if you, got, if you got a good highlighter and you go out like in the evening and it's kind of dark outside, but there's still what, extra ultraviolet. In the, in the, you know, coming that we can't see, but the highlighted marks almost look like they're glowing. Mm -hmm. Like they just seem too mm -hmm. bright. Or a black light, no, then it'll really show up. Mm. You know, so that's, that's fluorescent. So these are fluorescent lights, because the ultraviolet turning into the light that we can see. And so the kind of light that comes out is based on what they paint the inside with. That's how you get the different temperatures of fluorescent lights. What what it, what it, not to be lewd, but I think cat urine has the same property. <laughs> it is. It's true. <laughs> and some kinds of, uh, uh, sometimes they put it in um, some kinds of like bleach or some detergents and things to make clothes look brighter. Really? Well, that's why if you're running under a black light and like white clothes, like your socks or whatever, shine real bright or something, or a t-shirt, I think it's because they, Weird. they add it to make it look extra bright. Mm. Sneaky, huh? Mm -hmm. Tricking you. 
Um, okay, so how do our eyes operate? Photons cause a chemical change in retinol. Um, the opsins to which the retinol is attached determine the sorts of light to which it is. Oh yeah, retinol is the thing that changes. It's when one cis bond turns into a trans bond. I don't know what those words mean. And I think it's this, like the bond is flipping. Like the atoms are sticking out this way, and then they go, and they reattach that way, like a clicking pen or something. Puts back and forth. Um, how does an LED work? Forget that. OK, ultraviolet. So now we can't see this anymore. Oh, by the way, look at the sizes of these things. What's the total width of the visual field? It goes from 380 nanometers to 750 nanometers. What, what, what's the factor of difference there? 370. In terms of uh, like geometric change, like how many times does the wavelength change? Is it 10 times bigger or a million times different? Doubles. Just doubles. That's really small. It's, a, it's an octave. Hmm. If these are musical frequencies, the whole visual range is just in one octave. Violet is double the wavelength of red, uh, double the frequency of red. Infrared goes from 720 nanometers to a millimeter. That's like, uh, yeah. you know, that's enormous in comparison. You know, it's, like a, it's got like a factor of a million, <laughs> which is um, mm -hmm. you know, like 20 octaves or something. So huge in comparison. Visual, so small. Okay, ultraviolet. <laughs> Um, oh, well, there's one other kind of spectrum. I forget it. Okay, ultraviolet. Uh, so, unlike most visual light, it should say, UV light's, UV light's more able to kick electrons out of their associated atoms. Oh, yeah. When fluorescence happens, you've got an atom and it's got electrons in it. What, basically what happens is the ultraviolet light hits the coating, bumps one of the electrons up to a higher level, like, it's like it bumps it up farther away from the nucleus, mm -hmm. and then when it falls back down, it lets out some light that we can, visible light that we can see. In terms of whether all that's actually true, we have to, you know, look at the moon model. Anyway, you know, whatever, this is how it's explained. So, uh, when you have ionizing radiation, you're not just bumping the electron up to then fall back down and release some other light, or you're bumping it around. Ionizing radiation means you hit the electron so hard that you actually kicked it out of the atom altogether. Hmm. And so there's a minimum amount of energy it takes to do that, just like there's an escape velocity for getting off of the Earth. You know, if it's, the energy is too small, you're not going to, you know, you can't throw a rock off that away from the Earth. It's going to fall back down. Ultraviolet light is like it's powerful enough to get escape velocity and hmm. leave the Earth altogether. Hmm. And that's what ionizing means, because now it's an ion. So only the um, only the stronger with ultraviolet is able to ionize. But even non-ionizing ultraviolet does more things that visible light can't. It can affect more chemical processes. So it might break apart a, a bond, a chemical bond, which it does all the time. I mean, you got things that are sitting out in the sun and they're getting ruined, especially like plastics, like nylon and things like that. When they sit out in the sun, they get brittle and get it's because the ultraviolet light is actually breaking the chemical bonds that are ma making that rope stick together, or whatever the substance is. That weathering and aging, that's ultraviolet doing that. Um, it does that to a class, too. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah, yeah, they were called chemical rays. That's what they were mm -hmm. called, as opposed to, before they were called ultraviolet, and you settled on names. They called them chemical rays. And like what Gervich studied, the biophotons, those are ultraviolet. So uh, you have the fading of polymers. So it can make chemical things happen. Uh, that's how we kill, we do disinfection with ultraviolet light, because it, 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 it like breaks up DNA. Mm. If you get the right. There's a certain, um, there's a certain frequency of ultraviolet that does not get through the atmosphere at all. And that's the great disinfecting one that we can use. Mm. Because organisms are so used to, wait, did I get that right? I'm sorry, I got that backwards. No, wait. And forget it. Anyway, <clears throat> we can use it to disinfect things, which is wonderful. Uh, we already talked about these lights, um, mercury lights, that's fluorescent. Uh, the, oh, yeah, LEDs, light emitting diodes, which work pretty well for visible light, they can get efficiencies of up to like over 50% in parts of the visual range. By the time you get to ultraviolet, they're really not very efficient anymore. 
it's, it's getting harder to make uh, ultraviolet light. It's the efficiency of a fluorescent? Oh, yeah, I don't know. 50? I think yeah. incandescent is about five or something. Uh, it's, yeah, it's mostly heat. Yeah. It's not light. Because the way incandescent works, it's making this whole black body radiation curve, and most of it's in the infrared, which, you know, we don't see. But you need to do all that to get enough in the visible part <laughs> actually be able to see it. I think so. we should use LEDs instead of fluorescent. <laughs> Well, think they also make the discrete bands. They don't have any flicker, but well, anyway, yeah, I, I like them better too. Um, so UV light can, can, you know, can cause chemical reactions to occur, occur, like curing wood stains, dental cements, and paint. So you get a filling or braces, and they want the stuff to dry quicker, mm -hmm. to dry, to cure quicker. They, they, they have a little ultraviolet light to shine on it, mm -hmm. so that it cures in a minute or two instead of. I guess you sit in there with your mouth open waiting for it to, you know, for an hour or something. Um, <laughs> so then we get x-rays. So, yeah, the number, the, the, the numbers here, people generally don't talk about 30 petahertz to 30 exahertz. Yeah, 30 petahertz to 30 exahertz. No one uses those terms, really. 10 picometers to 10 nanometers, not probably. 100 electron volts to 100 kilo electron volts. Those are the kinds of numbers you generally use to describe these x-rays. Because it's a number, it just sounds more natural than talking about, you know, trillions of this or one trillionth of that. And you can just say 2,000 electron volts. More convenient unit. Also, because the way we make them. Okay, now we can talk about these x-rays. Uh, well, okay, so the way this thing works, and afterwards you can well, pass it around just don't you know, please don't break it this is really important <laughs> but I make a mess so that you'll look, you when you take a look at it see there's just basically the way you make an electron gun is you just get a piece of metal hot and give it a negative charge and an electron the electrons just start fall, fall, flying out of it that's really mm -hmm. all there is to it so you get where the uh, let me draw this cooks tube here so you'd have we got a tube. We suck all the gas out of it using our brand new mercury pump, which is fantastic. We've got this thing here. This is the cathode. It's got a negative charge, and then it's gonna. Here's here's this thing that's got a positive charge, called the anode. So the electrons, they're they're coming out of here. This is negatively charged. So are the electrons. They don't want to stick around there. They get this nice positive thing over here. They all run towards it. So the difference in the volts here, how many volts the, the difference is, that depends how much that electron is going to get pushed from one to the other. The volts are almost like the height that you're dropping a rock. It's almost like you're dropping a rock off here and then it falls down and smacks this. The bigger the voltage difference, the quicker it's going to go when it hits this, this side. So these electrons are applying towards this positive thing. In a TV, you know, instead of being a piece of metal that they hit and you don't see it, it's basically like a positive ring that they get pulled towards. Mm -hmm. And then they're moving, and then so they're flying forward, they get steered, and then they hit the front of the screen, which is coated with phosphors like these, incandescent, uh, these fluorescent lights. And when the electrons hit the phosphor, they make it glow. That's how, that's how TV sets work. So it's not light being transmitted from the back. It's a, light, it's a beam of electrons mm -hmm. that then get the front excited and make it glow. Um, anyway, so if, uh, if it does smack into the, the positive thing, the anode, depending on what it's made out of, it could make an x-ray fly out. So like the dental x-ray machine is basically just like that. It'll have probably 10,000 volts. The electrons are coming out. They're flying over here, and when they hit it, 1% of them will turn into x-rays and fly off. Mm. And those are the things that, you know, that look at your teeth. Mm. But it's very, that's why this thing has this warning on it. It says, warning, this tube employs x-radiation and implosion protection, replaced with a tube of the same type number for continued safety. X-radiation warning, do not operate this tube, cathode ray tube, CRT, old monitors called CRT monitors, a cathode, it's a cathode ray. Do not operate above the maximum voltage, 
Such abnormal operation may produce X radiation, which may be a health hazard. Don't sit too close to the TV. <laughs> well, it says avoid exposure for prolonged periods of close range, but anyway, your parents were right when they told you that. <laughs> Probably wasn't really making x-rays, but, you know, burn your eyes or something. Um, let's see. Okay, so x-rays, also in terms of how that happens, let's say this thing's made of, you know, some metal like tungsten or something like that. But here's how tungsten looks according to Dr. Science or, you know, somebody. You got a nucleus, you got these electrons flying around it. The only way it makes an x-ray is when one of these electrons, these cathode rays, fly towards the tungsten or whatever, and they've got to take one of the two electrons that are in the innermost shell, and they have to kick that electron out of the atom altogether. And then, an electron from a higher shell, instead of like one close by falling in, one that's higher, way high up, has to fall into that hole. One that's farther up has to fall into Is that, that hole. Is that what we see? That makes the x-ray. The energy difference between huh. being up here and then being... It's kind of weird exactly why that works, but so they say, well, there's an energy associated with being here. Like, mm -hmm. a roll, like a stone at the top of a mountain rolls to the bottom, it'll have a certain speed when it's there. Mm -hmm. So that when this electron falls down here, or all that energy that it had as it, you know, fell in there, it doesn't just keep, like, it's sort of like when it catches it, it has to do something with all of that energy, so it hmm. emits an x-ray. I mean, you know, something like that. Hmm. How it really works, it seems kind of a mystery, but that's why you only get 1% of these, you know, you're not getting tons of x-rays out of this. Mostly, you're making this thing get hot, and you have to have a, a cooling element to keep your x-ray machine from getting hot. Okay, so... So x-rays are so powerful that they, hmm. Anyway, x-rays are so powerful that they don't change the energy level of an electron, but they, they kick electrons out of atoms mm -hmm. altogether. Although right here we saw that it corresponds to this difference between electron energies, but anyway. Uh, so x, I, basically all x-rays are ionizing. If an x-ray hits an atom, it's one of those electrons that's gonna kick the, it's gonna kick the electron out altogether. So there's three main ways that X-rays interact with materials. Photoabsorption, it's a photoelectric effect. It hits something and kicks the electron out. That's one. Compton scattering and Rayleigh scattering. Photoabsorption is when an X-ray kicks out an electron and gives it all of its energy. Sometimes when the X-ray hits the electron, um, So here's an electron landing its own business. Or maybe it wasn't, but whatever. An x-ray comes and hits it. It might knock it, let's say it knocks it out of the atom. Sometimes though, in addition to the electron getting shot off on a certain path, you also get a new x-ray come out as well. So it's like the x-ray gave part of its energy to the electron, but kept some of it for itself, and then sunk to being a less energetic kind of x-ray. Mm -hmm. Which is weird, you say, well, how does it bump into, how does this thing that's not really, doesn't have any mass, how does it bump into something? And, mm -hmm. hmm, tough, huh? How do you have the conservation of momentum in this phenomenon? What's the momentum of a photon? Uh, I don't know what Rayleigh scattering is. That's for later. Wait, so it is the case that, that's why I kind of missed right in the beginning, it is the case that photons don't have a mass? Yeah. Well, since if you use general relativity. Yeah. Then well, in 1902, they don't have a mass. <laughs> 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 I can't that. <laughs> They kind of, they, they don't, not, not in the same way as other things do. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it gets kind of weird, because they do, I mean, they are bent by gravity, I mean, they are bent by big things. Mm -hmm. So, but if you just say the space was bent, then you're fine. You kind of have nothing to do with them having mass. And, Anyway, yes, they, their mass is zero. 
Uh, so how do we make x-rays? Oh yeah, we just talked about that. Accelerate an electron from a cathode, slam it into an anode, it'll make x-rays. In an x-ray tube, the hot cathode emits electrons thermionically, which are then accelerated towards the anode by the potential difference of the electron beam that hits the anode, 1% turn to x-rays, the rest is heat. There's two ways that it makes them. Fluorescence, <laughs> words get used again. Fluorescence is when the electron pops an orbital electron out of an inner electron shell, and a higher one falls into place, that's what I showed, by falling into the K innermost shell. They're called K lines. If you look at this, a spectrum of x-rays coming out of, like for a certain kind of metal, we'll say this is the kind of x-ray you'd expect to get out of it when you hit it with electrons, and they're, they're sharp lines. There's also something called bremsstrahlung, which is the slowing of an electron when it passes by a heavy nucleus of an electron. Now, so it's pull, it gets pulled inwards, and while it does that, it emits a photon. Not entirely sure exactly when it does that. Let's draw this up. So here we got our nucleus. And I've got my cathode, I've got my electron gun. I've got this electron that's flying by. You know, it likes that nucleus, it kind of gets bent a little bit. Somewhere while it's moving past it, it uh, spits out an X-ray. And then, I suppose, it instantly changes its speed and direction, because it just gave off a quantum of energy, so its momentum has changed in a quantum way, too. Why does it change its, why does it change its energy? Not really sure. I really don't know. It's just the Brems, it means like breaking or something like it's like when it's going around the curve. I really don't know. This is basically the same as synchrotron radiation, which we're about to look at too. Oh yeah, here's the next picture. Oh yeah, so that's my question. Is there quantum indeterminateness in this? Uh, medical X-ray machines, 20 to 150,000 volts. Here's another way, synchrotron radiation. Basically, this, a synchrotron is... So if you want to, in terms of a particle accelerator, let's say I'm trying to accelerate electrons to hit something to do an experiment. I'm going to smash some atoms. Well, here's how I, here's how I get them to go quickly. So I've got my cathode gun here, so electrons are coming out of it. And then, so this is negatively charged. And then, if I just had like a ring here, this is a side, this is a whole ring, you know, it's coming out of the board. If it's positively charged, the electron's gonna say, oh, I really wanna get there. So, speed up and go towards it. And then once it's passed it, turn the ring off so it doesn't pull it backwards, <laughs> right? As a matter of fact, maybe you build another ring here. And as soon as it passes this ring, you switch it so now it's negative, pushing the electron away. And this one's positive, pulling it towards it. Mm. So you have a bunch of these rings, you can speed it up as it goes along. It, the maglev train is similar. Oh, yeah. It keeps, it keeps changing where it wants to get pulled towards, oh, and really? the train keeps getting pulled along. And linear magnets yeah, like work exactly the same mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just using mm -hmm. magnets wow. instead of just an electric charge. So that's great, but you know, if you want it to go faster, you've got to make the tube longer and longer. So if you want a certain energy of an electron, you'd say, well, you know, we need, a, we need to have an experiment that's 20 miles long, and that might not happen. So instead, what you do is you make it go in a circle. So here's how a cyclotron or a synchrotron works. We, it ends up going in a circular path. So here's our path that the particle's going to go on. So there's a magnetic field that's going this way in and out of the board. Like if I had a north-south magnet, here's a magnet, and south, it would be like this. When, it, when an electrically charged thing moves through a magnetic field, it gets, its path gets bent. And so, um, like in a, in a toka, I forget that, okay. Well, okay, in a, in a tokamak, the magnetic field goes along in the same direction inside, one of the magnetic fields goes in the same direction as the tokamak does, and the charged particles get caught in spirals. In the, the way a tokamak, the magnetic field holds things inside, isn't that it repels them from the walls, it's that it forces them to move in a way that keeps mm -hmm. them always bending back towards the middle. Okay. Anyway, 
So the magnetic field keeps this charged thing moving in a circle. And then right when it gets to this gap, we make this negative and this positive. So once it's in that little gap, we push it away and it gets pulled towards this. So it gets a little bit faster and it goes around. Then we make it a little bit faster and it goes around. And then a little bit faster, a little bit faster, and a little bit faster. And at a certain point, you have to turn the magnetic field up once it starts getting relativistic speed. I forget that. Anyway, sometimes while it's going through this and bending, it'll emit radiation also. Mm -hmm. And that's synchrotron radiation. It sounds like exactly the same thing as the brown trawling. But the but why? Well, the this one is emitting radiation because it's speeding up. The other one is emitting radiation because it's slowing down. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the radiation is not here. It would be somewhere along, just it's along the, the bend, along the curve. Actually. It's the, it's because of the bending and not the changing of speed. Right. Right. Even with the Bremsstrahl. Well, it's bending. It it does change its when electrons are when when they're when they're emitting this synchrotron radiation, they're going to slow down because they just gave up some of their speed when they made that photon. I don't really know how this stuff works. I, know, I think this is one of the ways that they make really powerful light sources of wavelengths that you really want or something. Still kind of a big mystery. I got a book on it and I look forward to reading it. But this, you can make any, you can make, this is one thing that crosses that you can make. If you got it, it, it might emit a radio wave. It might emit a microwave. I, not that it's random, but you could, you know, you, it could, this, this sort of process could basically make the whole gamut of, of electromagnetic radiation. So this is one of the things that actually sort of does make the whole spectrum a continuum. Because you can, it could make just about anything. So, all right, gamma rays. Where do we get gamma rays on Earth? Radioactive decay and cosmic rays and lightning. Um, Basically, you know, these cosmic particles that are falling in towards the Earth, when they start interacting with the atmosphere by this Bremsstrahlung or Compton effect or something like that, they start spitting off gamma particles. Because it's like some electron, you know, coming from the Milky Way at a bajillion, you know, at like almost the speed of light or something. It has a lot of energy and it can, and it can give it up to the It'll Anyway, it makes gammas. Um, why are they called gamma rays? Well, the first radiation was beta radiation. It's now called beta. At the time, it was just called radiation. Uh, that was Becquerel in 1896, followed by alpha rays, discovered by Rutherford in 1899. And then in 1903, Rutherford named them based on how penetrating the radiations are. Mm -hmm. He discovered that they acted differently. In a tube, the alpha particle, alpha part radiation would bend a little bit in a magnetic field. Beta would bend more in the magnetic field, and the gamma would just go straight. So they could distinguish them, and the names came from the fact that the alpha particles wouldn't go very far through, you know, like a piece of wood or something. Or lead. Or lead. The betas would go further. They could go through a thicker piece of whatever. And the gammas could really could go through all sorts of things, like it wasn't even there. So are they different? Well, I guess they yeah. <laughs> Well, no, yeah, they are. I mean, like radiation. But they're not all a certain type of gamma ray, though. That's no, no, no. It's funny. The word radiation, like radiation safety, and all this, it could mean an alpha part, right? Alpha. It could mean beta. It could mean gamma. But they're totally. They're all different things. An alpha particle is like a helium nucleus. A beta is like an electron, and a gamma ray is a photon. So they're all called radiation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, and then each kind, each 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 piece of it can have a different amount of energy. You could have a very energetic beta decay. You could have a very weak beta decay. Mm -hmm. you know, a very weak alpha decay, you know, couldn't get through your skin. So the names came from how far they could go. Alpha's least penetrating, beta's further, gamma's could go really far, and alpha, beta, gamma are the first three letters of it. It's A, B, C. For gamma for their C. Um, Okay, so where do we get these things? One example, potassium-40. This is maybe unduly complicated. Anyway, so let's just say that something, when a, when a decay happens, when an atom changes into another atom, let's say I've got some atom and I emit an alpha particle. 
So I just threw away two protons and two neutrons. Now, what are the odds that the shape of the nucleus with that hole in it, is that really the way that that new atom wants to exist? Probably not. There's probably a better configuration for the whole nucleus. You probably want to settle in and not just leave that hole there. So this is weird. You've heard of isotopes, right? For car carbon's got six protons. If it also has six neutrons, it's carbon-12. If you have carbon with six protons and eight neutrons, it's carbon-14. Well, there's more than one way of putting 14 pro uh, having protons and having 14 of them, there's more than one way of arranging them. There's one, always one best way to arrange them. But you can put them in the non-best way, and it'll fall down into what's called the ground state. So use this very specific example, potassium-40. The nucleus, it, it thinks that it, it just wishes it had more neutrons and less protons. It thinks it has, it just really wants, it, that, for whatever reason, it wants that. So it actually pulls an electron out from among the electrons around it, pulls one in, turns a proton into a neutron. But when it does that, it's not the stable state of that new uh, argon atom. So the nucleus sort of shifts and settles. And when it does that, it emits a gamma ray. Mm -hmm. So for that case of that uh, potassium, it emits a 1.46 mega electron volt gamma ray. So basically, everything that's radioactive emits gamma rays. Let's say it emits an alpha particle. It's not the best way for the nucleus to be shaped now. If it settles down, it'll also emit a gamma. Let's say it emits a beta particle. The odds are it's not as good as it should be. When it settles down, it's going to emit a gamma. Not all of them, but I think pretty much all of them do this. So that's called iso So just as one element has different isotopes by the different number of neutrons, so too an isotope can have multiple isomers, which are like different shapes of the nucleus. Mm. Same number of protons and neutrons, but arranged differently. That's mm. called an isomer. Mm. Um, usually, that new nucleus, after the decay, it's very unstable and instantly turns to the stable version and emits a gamma particle. However, if it takes an extra long time, by a long time for an atomic physicist means less than uh, a billion, more than a billionth of a second, <laughs> if it takes a very long time like that, it's called metastable. It's a metastable isomer. So these metastable isomers, they exist in an excited state, which what that means is kind of not really understood, but it's, you know, it wants to fall down to a different kind. Mm -hmm. The most common one that people run into is technetium 99M. So when you see this isomer written, you know, I said we got a you know, medical test, technetium 99M. Why the M? Technetium 99M is not the same thing as technetium 99. Both of these exist. They're different. Technetium 99 has a half-life of, I think, like a million years or something. Technetium 99M has a half-life of six hours. So since that's more than a billionth of a second, it's considered a very long time by you know, nuclear physicists, so they give it the little m. So the difference in energy, when the technetium 99m falls down to make the lower kind of technetium, it emits a gamma particle, a gamma ray. It lets out energy. Are these settlings all part of the different decay chains in the periodic table, or does this one be like for something? I didn't even know this existed until a week ago. When, when they show the decay chains, and they say this emits an alpha, this emits a beta, they don't really, they, they leave out the gamma that's there, because it basically, it, it's usually not important. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't change elements. It doesn't the change ones. the element, it doesn't change the isotope. Oh, okay, they're changing elements. Because alpha and beta or are... are yeah. Alpha and beta are electrons or neutrons. Alpha is a is two neutrons and two protons. A beta is an electron. So emitting either an alpha or a beta is actually changing the element. Right. Emitting a gamma is, is not, not changing. Beta is not changing. Sure it is. Where did the beta come from? An electron. An orbital electron? No. Where did it come from? It came from a neutron turning into a proton which stayed in the nucleus. 
and then emitting the other electron out. That's beta decay. So in beta decay, it's funny, it's the word decay, but it actually moves up in the periodic table. Mm -hmm. That's All funny. Right. Yeah. So, um, anyway, yeah, they're usually not written in because they just happen almost instantly. So they go out of their way to write when there is a non ground, when there's like an excited state. Basically, you, from molybdenum, you have molybdenum 99. Well, we're going to get it. Let me talk about it. It's used, for, it's used for medical diagnostics, and it's the ideal thing for doing medical imaging. Um, you get molybdenum 99 from fission. So you got uranium, it's breaking up, it's making everything in the world. <laughs> everything. You pull out the molybdenum 99, which has a shell, which has a half life of like two and a half days. Not a long time. But it's longer than six hours. You send the molybdenum over to the whatever the lab is, it's going to be using a technetium. The molybdenum 99 turns into turns into technetium. This technetium, they then make it into like technetium oxide. They then basically make it part of some biological material, like some kind of sugar or something like that. Then they inject it in your body. And wherever that organic molecule would have gone, it's now got technetium, uh, you know, tagging along for the ride. So maybe they'll inject something that some molecule that tumors would use a lot of. Maybe it's some some organic molecule that happens it's used a lot in cell reproduction and you got a cancer somewhere in your body well that cancer is going to get a lot of that concentrating there because it's reproducing really quickly the technetium makes its own x-rays they just put x-ray film around you basically and the x-rays are coming out of your own body Whoa. the technetium is emitting gamma rays and so then they, you know they take a look at you while you're emitting it well, and then after six hours, you know, it's half gone. So it's got a very short half-life, so it gets its stuff out, and then it's done. And then it turns into this, which has a half-life of a million years, which means it's barely radioactive at all. So they, they love this. It's like ideal for this kind of medical imaging. Mm -hmm. It's just you have to get that molybdenum from fission. So it's all kind of... Anyway, it's, it's really fascinating. Oh, and when, it, when um, this is such a... The energy difference is pretty small. It's only 140 kiloelectron volts which is within the range of an x-ray machine. Mm -hmm. So it really is, you can use a normal CAT scan machine or something and just turn the x-ray emitter part of it off mm -hmm. and have the person, you know, get the scan. Mm -hmm. That's what that picture in All the Worlds of Mine was, I think. Was, mm -hmm. I might have been I take it back, it might have been foreign. Okay, we're almost done here. Um, so this is this amazing diagram here on this page. It shows all the different, this is for lutetium, it shows these are all the different ways the nucleus could be. The nucleus could be all these different states. And uh, they're basically all, you know, they instant, they're all so unstable that if it's, once it's at the top one, the 177M lutetium, once it falls down, it's going to keep falling down. But uh, so you, this just should, you get a variety of gammas coming out of things when they decay by other means, too. Okay. Hmm. Home stretch here. Um, how do gamma? How does gamma interact with matter? Photoelectric effect. Gamma kicks out an electron. The electron now is going really fast. It has all the gamma's energy. There's the Compton effect again. Gamma hits an electron. Electron flies off with most of the energy, and we get a new gamma ray or X-ray or whatever. Hmm. Some of the energy stays in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Some of it went to giving the electrons some speed. And if the gamma particle is very energetic, it'll simply disappear and turn into matter and antimatter. Pretty neat, huh? That's called pair production. So if you've got really high energy gamma particles, gamma rays, it seems that they don't just do this on their own, like out in empty space. But something like when they're near other, other matter, they like, really want to turn into matter to join in on the fun or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this gamma particle, mm -hmm. well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't move in a pretty straight line. Mm -hmm. It's flying along, and then it turns into an electron and a positron. Mm -hmm. And now it's just went from energy into matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pretty weird, huh?
So. Where does that happen? Just uh, like if some gamma, th if maybe it was coming from a deep space, and then when it's getting into Earth's atmosphere, it'll stop being a gamma particle and it'll turn into an electron and a positron. And then, but then these things, they're you know, this is going to like bump into something else and make a new gamma ray, and you get a whole cascade of things that happen when one of these comes into the atmosphere. It might make a whole bunch of different things happen, a whole bunch of different energy uh, uh, ra radiation. Oh, isn't that what they were saying was happening above lightning storms in the atmosphere? And they're always like, like shooting out all these gamma oh. rays. Like we, we sent this telescope up to look at where gamma rays were coming from in outer space, and then. It was like behind the back of this thing, all these gamma rays started shooting. I was like, "What?" Turned it on top of lightning storms. There's this kind of mm -hmm. this kind of thing going on. Yeah, and then if you do have it, and then some of those gammas that came out of the lightning, they turn into. It, it's sort of I I don't really know, but it's just this is a possible thing that the yeah. energy turns into matter all of a sudden, which could then make and turn back into because. This, this positron, it's going to find an electron pretty soon, because they're all over the place, and then it's going to turn into two gamma rays. Hmm. This one's going to come over here. Into energy? It's going to hit this thing, and then, you know, and then two, uh, two new gamma, gamma particles are going to come out of it. Hmm. So, um, well, that's about it. Um, in terms of terms, if it came from an electron, it's, you should probably call it an X-ray. If it popped out of a nucleus, you should probably call it a gamma. And, uh, So radio, it's really about electricity, electromagnetics. Light, you see that it acts like a wave, all these things. The really energetic ones, it definitely seems more like you know, the particle nature that comes out a lot more. And the energy increases. Radio waves aren't going to do anything, except for move really large things, like electricity and an antenna. The microwaves are getting short enough that they can interact with molecules, because now they're down to the size of molecules, so they can live with molecules and heat your food. The uh, infrared is small enough to be just one of those bonds in the molecule, mm -hmm. and then when it absorbs it, we can try to determine what that molecule is. Light, visible light, it's now becoming energetic enough to actually change those bonds, the way they work. That's how our eyes see. Visible light in ultraviolet, it's now enough to actually move the electrons in the atom around, or even kick them out of the atom altogether. And then, um, x -rays. yeah, the x-rays are so strong, they're always going to kick the atom out if they hit it. Mm -hmm. And then gamma rays are so strong that they can even turn into matter. <laughs> yeah. Are those, you know, the x-rays that are used in crystallography, they have a different interaction with matter because they diffract right. through the crystal grading. So they it's not really scattering or a ionization that absorption. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So they have some of those. Good point. You also have the uh, fourth kind of radiation. In addition to the alpha beta and gamma. Neutron radiation. Yeah, you can have neutron emission. Yeah, that has its own role too. So, in terms of where this is going to go, um, as you noticed, even though this first started coming from trying to look at particle accelerators, there really wasn't much about accelerating particles here. <laughs> So we can come back to that. The other thing is to start doing some of these, um, pull together some of the basic experiments that show, go through what's electricity, what's magnetism, what's the relationship between electricity and magnetism. Um, so put some of those together and show them off for next time.
Is well, I'm just wondering. Um, what it's like, <laughs> you know, the, the sun, the nucleus. Is that a constant? For example, the case of sun is a constant fusion reactions. Is it really what's happening? And then, um, in that case, what's the, the uh, normal stable state? Well, um, we know if we if we. Um, Things that are stable, if we, if we take things that aren't stable, things that do decay, that are radioactive, um, those things do change even here on Earth. Like the rates of, decay rates of different things change differently. One big experiment of it looked at like during, over the year, there was a period, it was small, but the rates of decay would change, you know, in summer versus winter. You know, with the you know, because the Earth gets closer and farther from the Sun. That's what they said was probably causing it. Uh, or there's a kind of a debate about whether the, uh, the thermal isotope, radioactive isotope, the radiothermal gener, the decaying plutonium on Voyagers was uh, which makes heat, which drives you know that's their source of power. Whether it was changing mm. in an unexpected way. And somebody wrote a paper saying it did, and some other people said that's ridiculous, it didn't at all. And the other guy had bad statistics. I never really sorted it all out. The other thing from the work of Schnoll, uh, who looked at, he looked at, he had some this radioactive thing that did alpha decay, and he would look at the rate of decay, and he didn't find an overall change in the decay rate, but he def, he found a change in the uh, the uh, messiness of the decay rate, you might say. Mm. In other words, how uneven is the decay rate, and he found relations of that to cosmological processes like the year. And the day, and the month. Really? Yeah. So there's definitely radioactive. You know, the nucleus is supposed to be so supreme and sovereign, and the only quantum randomness determines what happens. But it's just not true. Uh, the decay rates definitely depend on the environment in ways that we really do not know yet. And especially if people believe it's impossible, they're probably going to be unlikely to study. <laughs> it's a problem sometimes, but it, it definitely happens. So it's. Could be quite distinct on Mars or something like that. Sure. Yeah, because we don't know what it is that's, I mean, what's making it change is unknown. I mean, all Schnoll's been able to do is get, um, you know, find these periodicities. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a, a specific cause that he hypothesized. Mm -hmm. The guys with the overall decay rate change, Fischbach, I think was one of their names, they had some hypothesis about, it's like, the number of neutrinos coming from the sun and you know, like a solar flare is also associated with the change in the rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's some, some of these bajillion subatomic particles making it happen. Or, but, I mean, Schnoll's idea is that every moment, every, every space is always different. Every moment in time is unique. Mm -hmm. And that we're moving through space. It's different all the time. Mm -hmm. um, But it's got a character. It's all you know. It's all every day at noon. There's something that's always the same. The relationship between the sun and the moon. And, I mean, sun and the earth. And, you know. So he did a little bit of look, work looking at directions too. He'd use a collimator, which is basically just like a long box. Like you know, if you had like a really long tube, you can only see what's like right in front of that tube. You can't see to the side or anything. Uh, he would detect these alpha particles. He just put a bunch of long. He put a long tube basically in front of the sample. So here's this thing that's decaying, and you put the tube way up here. 
That way you'd only see alpha particles that were going in that direction. And then he could just move the whole apparatus around and also to see if he could learn anything about the... He got the time already. He was trying to see about the direction. And he found something, but I forget what it is right now. One type of decay, electron capture, uh, that one you can prevent if you take away all the electrons. So that's one kind of radioactive decay that we can change. That's not one, anyway, it's not one of the ones I usually talk about, though. But they're definitely not, not sovereign actors, nuclei. Mm -hmm.